Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To Brexit or not to Brexit, that is the question. Theresa May's plan to exit the EU has been roundly criticized from virtually every quarter. And with a looming deadline, the UK could face a hard Brexit without an agreement, even early elections. How did it get to this point? Crosstalking Brexit. I'm joined by my guests in London, Marcus Papadopoulos. He's the editor of Politics First magazine. We also have Alexander Mercurius. He's a writer on legal affairs as well as editor in chief of the Duran.com. And we have Alistair Donald. He is an associate director of the Academy of Ideas. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want. And I always appreciate it. Marcus, let me go to you first. Um, I'm titling this program Broken Brexit. Is that an appropriate title for this program? Do you think? Go ahead. Well, Peter, allow me to say this. I do not like the European Union, and I never have liked it. Um, but at the same time, I don't like the Brexit camp, and I don't like the Remain camp. Why? Because both camps are two sides of the same coin. They share the same politics, the same economics, and the same foreign policy objectives. And they are inherently anti-Russian and they support Western global hegemony. However, let me say this. As a member of the parliamentary press gallery, I have a front row seat, so to speak, and I can assure people watching this episode of Crosstalk that Brexit is extraordinarily complicated. It is not simple. It is not black and white. And anyone who says otherwise is not to be trusted. Theresa May has struggled over two and a half years of her premiership with Brexit, but no one should be under the illusion that if uh, Jeremy Corbyn or if someone from the Conservative Party, Jacob Rees-Mogg or Boris Johnson or Dominic Raab was leader, it would be any more effective than Theresa May. Britain is in uncharted waters. Yep. And I would also say this, Peter, that, there are, that Brexit is wrought with risks and dangers. One of them, for example, concern, concerns Northern Ireland. Now, I will make this point. It is absolutely imperative that there is a soft border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Otherwise, if there is a hard border, that could potentially undermine the Good Friday Agreement. And if the Good Friday Agreement is undermined, that could result in um, uh, an eruption of yeah. violence in Northern Ireland, the likes of which you know we haven't seen for a great many years. So I do not, I do not like the European Union, but this is unbelievably complex. Okay, Alistair, let me go to you. Did Theresa May get the best deal that she could get? Because I'm, I have to really question. I, you know, she repeatedly said Brexit means Brexit. So is her deal? Does it really mean Brexit? Because just about everybody has a, a, a negative opinion one way or another about how she understands what Brexit's all about. Go ahead, Alistair. Yeah, I, well, I, I agree to the extent uh, that uh, unravelling 40 years of being a member of a, a supranational organisation is not going to be easy. Uh, and there's lots of complexities uh, about the whole situation that anybody that was charged with negotiating Brexit is going to have to deal with. Um, but the fact remains that uh, we're in a situation now where the deal that's on the table is one that will see Britain in a formal, possibly technical sense, uh, leave the EU, but it will remain bound by the rules of the EU uh, for the foreseeable future with no apparent mechanism to get out of the EU. I mean, in a way, those that have said it's a, it's a worse situation than currently being member of, uh, members of the EU are to some extent correct because we will be in a situation where uh, we are, whether it's in a transition period or potentially into any sort of uh, backstop agreement if we don't have a, a, a kind of bespoke agreement, we'll be in a situation where we don't actually have the mechanism to leave because we will need the European Union's agreement to do that, while still uh, in all sorts of areas of life, whether in social policy or environmental policy, economic policy, or uh, under the jurisdiction of the law courts and the European Court of Justice, we will be still forced uh, to subsist under 
under European Union rules. So I think it's uh, it's it's not it's not Brexit is is the bottom line of this. We have a deal that is not Brexit. Alexander, I guess you know to be a purist in looking at um, what was voted on, that means leaving mm. the European Union. And I suppose now, mm. considering all of the uh, questions and criticisms of May's plan, is hard Brexit a real uh, option right now? And if it is, what does that actually mean? Because it's looming, my, mm. my friend. It's looming. Go ahead. Well, I, I think it is, if you like. Uh more a default position than an option because of course nobody says that they want it but it might happen if the parliamentary arithmetic is such that there is no agreement either on Brexit uh, on on Theresa May's Brexit plan or on anyone else's I mean at that stage Britain leaves the European Union in March 2019 without a deal with all the problems that go with that. Now, can I just go back to a point which uh, um, uh, Marcus and Alistair were making? I think a lot of the trouble has been the great secrecy with which Theresa May has conducted this negotiation. She could have said right at the beginning that what she wanted was to keep Britain in a customs union or a customs arrangement with the, with the European Union, negotiated with the European Union on that basis, and I think there would have been support for that both in the European Union and in the House of Commons. Or she could have said, we want to completely leave the European Union entirely and all its institutions, and then negotiated on that basis, looking for a timetable, perhaps a period of five to ten years, while step by step we disengage, but with the eventual destination clear. She didn't really do either of those things. Mm. Mm. She gave the impression that that she wanted a complete no, uh, a clean break. But in the end, because she conducted the negotiation so secretly, she ended up with something else. And it is this which is creating, I think, a lot of the ill feeling that we're talking about. And it is this which is creating issues like possibilities of a no-deal Brexit. Or, alternatively, we're seeing now people talking about a second referendum, which it seems to me is really an attempt to rerun the referendum okay. which has already well, happened. That's the EU strategy when the people fail, have another vote here. Uh, Marcus, but, yeah. believe it or not, I'm actually uh, a little bit sympathetic to Theresa May. I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. But if we go back to the election in 2016, I don't really think people understood what Brexit actually entailed. I mean, it's, it's kind of easy to say, well, we leave the European Union. But as you said, it's a far more complex than that. And the, the common market, I mean, I think most common sense people would say, yeah, we, we kind of want to stay in that. Maybe the immigration thing and all the, these things could be talked about here. But um, I mean, it's, it's really about the economy. And the, I, I can't see how the deal is being could have been foreseen then after what we've seen for the last two years because I like the point that was made. Any politician in Theresa May's uh, position would, will, will, would, will end up paying um, a, a heavy political price because of what was decided in 2016, which was not particularly obvious then. Go ahead, Marcus. Well, I'm going to have to uh, disagree with you, Peter. Okay. I don't feel sympathy for Theresa May. Okay. Um, but I, I do think it, it is wrong and it is un unintelligent for people to be um, singling her out for this ferocious criticism. Because as I said moments ago, would it be any different if Dominic Raab or sure. if uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg were leader? Well, they would satisfy a part of the Conservative Party, but they wouldn't satisfy the other parts of the Conservative Party. So let's just say Theresa May is forced to resign and let's just say someone from the right, Dominic Raab, becomes leader of the Conservative Party. Well, the Brexiteers are going to be delighted. But then the other part of the Conservative Party, um, who are either actively supportive of the European Union or passively supportive, um, will not be happy. So we will be back at this stalemate. But you know, Peter, I think ultimately what it comes down to is this. I personally do not believe in referendums. Uh, Harold Wilson never believed in referendums. 
Uh, Margaret Thatcher never believed in referendums. There are some subjects, and I do not mean to sound condescending, but there are some subjects they are so difficult to understand that the ordinary well, person cannot well, really be Well, I don't know. You, you and I... I find, you I find, and I, I find so economics... Can, so I, can, you and I disagree on this here, but I, you know, one, one could make the argument, can, let me go to Alistair on this here, is that there's some issues that are so very important that you must have a referendum. I'll turn uh, Marcus's idea uh, uh, point ups, uh, upside down here. Alistair, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there are some very important issues of constitutional matters that you you uh, do decide to have a, a referendum on, and it is not as if this referendum was just an instant decision. It's been agitated for amongst sections of society ever since, uh, well, at least since the Maastricht deal in the, in the early 90s, and and certainly around the time of the Lisbon Treaty and and onwards. So uh, I think people wanted uh, to have a say on this this very important issue, and it's. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit sad in, in the time since the referendum that one of the things that's come forward quite a lot of the time in order to call the referendum into dis, disrepute is, is the idea that people, uh, the, the nation's people, are not in a position to, to judge uh, what the future of society should be on these very important issues. Because I think, you know, when I look back at the, the referendum campaign, everybody everybody was engaged yeah, uh, yeah. To, to trying to understand all these quite difficult and complex issues. Everybody had something to say about it. You never barely met anyone throughout that time that didn't have an opinion. They were doing their best to kind of understand the detail, but also the, the big sort of overarching implications. So I think it was a very important thing to have a okay. referendum on. Okay, and Alistair, hold, hold that thought. And the pro I, I've, the got go, I've got to go to, is, a, I've have to go to a hard break here. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Brexit. Stay with RT. The path of China's economy in the last 15 years is not different than other countries emerging that were once emerging economies that became big economies like the United States did the same thing. Uh, they were export, exporting at it with unfair advantages until they got big, and then uh, they transitioned to a uh, consumer economy. So China and Britain before then did the same thing. So China is just following history, and now they want to become a big consumer economy, and uh, so far, so good. Fracking gave Americans a lot of new job opportunities. I needed to come up here to make some money. I can make $25,000 as a teacher, or I can make $50,000 a year driving trucks, so I chose to drive truck. People rush to a small town in North Dakota with an unemployment rate of 0%. It was like a gold rush. It is very, very similar to a gold rush. But this beautiful story ended with pollution and devastation. A lot of people have left here. I don't know too many people here anymore. It's just slowed down too much. They lost their jobs, got laid off. The American dream is changing. That's not what it used to be. And it's a tough reality to deal with. Nobody could see coming that false confessions would be that prevalent in this population of wrongful conviction. If you look at any interrogation out there, what you'll see is threat, promise, threat, promise, threat, lie, lie, lie. The process of interrogation is designed to put people in just that frame of mind. Make them uncomfortable, make them want to get out, and don't take no for an answer. Don't accept their denials. She said if I would uh, cooperate, sign a statement, that I would be home by that time the next day. There's a culture of unaccountability, and police officers know that they can engage in misconduct that has nothing to do with solving a crime. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing Brexit.
Okay, let me go back to Alexander McCurris in London. Uh, it's already been mentioned in this program, but I think we need to put some, shed some more light on it. Okay, let's, let's say that uh, Theresa May uh, lose, uh, loses a vote of confidence, uh, her deal doesn't mm -hmm. pass Parliament, um, this deadline remains. Um, it doesn't really matter about Theresa May anymore. I mean, because whoever mm. replaces her is going to have the same dilemma and, and in making, a, a appeasing a, a wide variety, wide array of uh, groups and ideas. I mean, this is, um, what do you guys call it, a sticky wicket? I don't know if you can say that on television. It's, <laughs> it's a mess. Okay, go ahead, Alexander. <laughs> it, it, it is a very complicated situation indeed. And if Theresa May falls, and if this deal is rejected, by the House of Commons, then in some ways it becomes even more complicated because the time. Oh, oh even more complicated! March, even more exactly, complicated! Exactly. <laughs> who, who, who in this situation takes over from Theresa May? I mean, there is no consensus within the Conservative Party on who the replacement to her would be. Um, there are difficulties about holding a general election and having a new government. And um, even if a new government, if an, even if there is an election and a new government is called, the new prime minister will need time to try and sort all this out. Now, he, he or she, whoever they are, could ask the European Union to extend the deadline by a couple of months, and they might agree to that. But again, coming back to a point Alistair was making earlier, it is the European Union, not Britain, that would decide that question. So yeah. I have to say this. Yep. I think in this kind of situation, um, MPs in the House of Commons looking at all of this are going to say to themselves, well, however bad this deal is or appears to us to be, better keep Theresa May, better pass this deal, because the options of doing otherwise are, 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 are so complicated and so difficult to judge that we would rather have what looks like the status quo continuing than resolve this issue before March and perhaps trigger a political crisis and in the case of some conservatives risk the possibility of Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister. Ah, you brought up the topic where I want to go. Marcus, that's that's Theresa May's final card, final high card, isn't it? The specter of a labor government and the specter of of Jeremy, uh, Jeremy becoming prime minister. Is she using that as a pol as a political point? Go ahead, Marcus. Oh, without any doubt, uh, that will uh, play a very, very influential role um, amongst the uh, on, on the conservative benches when the vote comes uh, about Theresa May's deal. Because even some, even though some conservative MPs are not happy with the deal, their greatest fear, of course, is Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister, and I think there would be um, a backlash. Um, amongst uh, against uh, many conservative MPs if they were to vote against the deal and if that was to uh, end up in a general election which at the moment um, Jeremy Corbyn would win so no conservative mm. MP wants to hand the uh, the keys to 10 mm. Downing Street to Jeremy Corbyn but let me just say this other thing uh, Peter I make no pretense to be an authority on economics because I'm not but I would say this that what is the worst thing for an, for an economy? It's not a bad deal, it's uncertainty. Now, I speak with a lot of diplomats over here, especially Chinese diplomats, and they have told me this, they would rather have a bad deal than uncertainty, because if you have a bad deal in the world of business, you know where you stand and you can do something about it. Chinese diplomats have told me that if they no longer see Britain as a bridge to the mainland of Europe to re-export their goods without paying tariffs, then they would have to seriously reconsider whether yeah. they have a presence in Britain. But if there's, if there's uncertainty, if there's no deal, that's what I'm driving at, Peter. If there's no deal, that's the worst deal of all. Alistair, you want to jump in? Go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah, I do because I, I just think it's very important to understand what Brexit is about. And the, the fact is that for the people that voted for Brexit, it wasn't primarily a case of economics. I'm not saying that everybody uh, was happy to have economic chaos, but I think there's a series of social and culture factors that sure. framed the decision and framed the vote for Brexit that are more important uh, than economics. And uh, I, I think that people have been prepared to suffer a little bit of uh, economic disruption disruption on the basis that in the long term we'll, we'll have something better and that you know the whole point of Brexit was to change things change means disruption that's that's the whole point and we cannot uh, allow Brexit to be undermined by the fears of uh, people having a, a, a fear of disruption because in a way that's that's what it's all about and I just think that where we are just now and where we've been for the last couple of years is that effectively we're having a Brexit moment in which the people have demanded Brexit and they've demanded that we leave the European Union, but we have no Brexit political leadership or Brexit movement, sure. as it were, that is able to lead us to that situation. And that's why we've got so much chaos just now, because uh, you know, the, even, the, even amongst the European research group or the, the Brexiteers within the Conservative Party in Parliament, they're kind of numb and don't, uh, you know, they have no real clear idea of how to move on this. They're Brexiteers, yes, possibly, but uh, they have no real uh, inclination as to how we resolve this situation. So for me, uh, the really big thing just now is that we have to uh, create a situation where the dynamics are shifted uh, to some extent. I think uh, whether it's Theresa May uh, being deposed or whether it's a general election, uh, you know, I, I, I leave that open as to what's the best solution. But for, somehow there has to be a shift in terms of what's happening because I think it's very important at this point to re-engage the British people in yep. the decision as to how we best get Brexit. Not having another vote as to whether we get Brexit but how we actually secure it because the people uh, rather than the politicians are the ones that have driven this process and yeah. I think we badly need them back on board to push I it think, further. I think Alex, it's a very, a very interesting point. Let me go to Alexander McKears, but how, how do you do that? I mean, how do you translate that into into action because I think it's fair to say that Theresa May never had her heart in it. I mean, actually, she was against uh, uh, Brexit uh, before she yes, became exactly. prime minister. I mean, so uh, I, you never saw her, she ever had her heart in it. I mean, she it was a mandate, and mm. she said she would go through with it, and that's what the, her plan is, what the, the, is the result here. I mean, it, it, was she... Do you think genuine in her attempt to get the best deal possible? I mean, it, it, or is that an impossible question to answer? Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I, I actually think in, in her own mind she was genuine. I say that in the knowledge that, of course, she voted Remain in the referendum. But I don't think Theresa May intentionally sabotaged this thing. I think that she didn't really understand some of the aspects of negotiating this thing properly. But coming back to a point that Alistair made, and indeed Marcus has also made, one should not put all the blame for this debacle on Theresa May. When David Cameron, the previous Prime Minister who called the referendum, resigned, the Brexiteers failed to organise properly and take the leadership of the Conservative Party and the country and take control of the negotiation then. Into that vacuum, Theresa May stepped in. And again, it is the same group of people who have allowed her to conduct negotiations in this way, sidelining her Brexit secretaries, not informing the cabinet regularly. Um, if they had wanted or pressed to be involved, it's difficult to see how she could have refused. So it is a crisis of the political class, uh, at least of the conservative part of the political class, that they have failed to lead this process through to any conclusion. And one has to say it's probably because going back to 2016, none of them expected to find themselves in that position because none of them expected that the British people would vote leave and that they have never really sorted themselves out since then. Mar Marcus, reflect upon that because I sometimes get the impression 
And I, and I think the, the, this storm that uh, Brexit has created is, on, is not going to be over for a while here. Is there Brexit fatigue mm -hmm. now among people? Is that, you know, it, it, the, 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 it, they're not even halfway through all of this. We could see new elections. We could see um, uh, uh, the specter of, of hard Brexit. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns out there. And they've been going around this for two years. Go ahead, Marcus. I think it's fair to say that the average Briton, even if those remain, uh, vo voted uh, for Remain, actually wants this issue to come to an end. They want to see Britain leave the European Union after the 31st of March 2019 because it has dominated uh, the political and economic scene in Britain for the last two and a half years. And Britain is going to leave the European Union after March 2019. I mean, that is going to happen. I would also say this about Theresa May. Um, she is a genuine politician. She's not lead she doesn't have leadership skills. No, she has that's shown a lot obvious. of determination with Brexit. <laughs> that's we, have obvious. To, we have to give her credit for that. But she is a very conscientious, hard working oh. MP. But Policy. Uh, let me just add Policy this, Peter. Wonk. It is true it, it is true that a lot of British people did not just vote for Brexit on the basis of economic reasons. They voted for matters of sovereignty. But what I say to the Brexit camp is this, and they never answer my question. I say, well, if, we're gonna, if Britain's going to hold a referendum on regaining its independence from the EU, fine, I don't like the EU. But how about Britain holding a referendum on regaining its independence from the United States of America? Okay, Alistair, I'm going to give you the last word. What's next? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very interesting just now the way that Theresa May is presenting things. I mean, the one thing that she's latched on to is immigration, which is about the only uh, thing yeah. within her withdrawal plan uh, that uh, she can say achieve something that uh, some people uh, wanted. I mean, she's always been completely illiberal on immigration. And, you know, as someone who's very liberal and wants freedom of movement, I've always uh, been against that. I'm a Brexiteer that, uh, uh, you know, quite likes freedom of movement so it's 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 um, you know I'm, I'm not particularly pleased that that's the thing that's been seized onto but the other thing I think that's interesting is is the way just now that she's constantly portrayed as a politician that has okay. resilience and Alistair, um, I'm sorry I think I've you know if jump you look in at the here, past two gentlemen, years then she I'm, hasn't had resilience I have to when jump in here we've run out of time ever since Frank Underwood died on on House of Cards I suggest everyone to turn to the Brexit channel now <laughs> because it's going to get really exciting many thanks to my guests in London and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.